Uh, and with that, I'd like to give the word to uh, Johan Rockström at Stockholm Resilience Center, director here, world leader in sustainability science, to tell us about the world today. W what is it like to live in the Anthropocene? And we need a headset for Johan, don't we? Or no, we're, give, we're actually giving you this one. Or, yeah. if you can, if you, or if you want to speak in this yeah. one. Either way. Um, does it matter? Okay. I, okay. I can you take use this one. one. But speak into it. It's for yeah. the um, recording. Thanks, uh, Lisen, and good morning, everyone. Wonderful to see you here. We're so excited, and uh, as Pat and Maya emphasized, this is an experiment for us, the collision between science and co-creation of solutions and innovation in that space. And what I will try to do is to give you an update of why this meeting is so incredibly important. Basically, a state of the art of where is the world heading, what are the risks we're facing, and why can science now say with one voice that we need transformative change? And transformative change means jumping into the deep end of the pool, means taking risks, means being really creative and out of the box. Uh, I will start, though, by uh, apologizing slightly. I just landed from Medellin in Colombia, so if I'm kind of tripling a little bit on my language here, simply because of a long trip. But let me tell you a little story that we experienced there. So the reason why the Resilience Center was there, was to co-host with the Colombian government and with the Swedish government a multi-stakeholder dialogue of why biodiversity really matters to ensure a transition to a sustainable global future. Now, Medellin, as you may know, is a city that just 15 years back was stamped as the world's most dangerous city. And can you imagine, the same day we were there, the Rockefeller Foundation classifies as Medellin as the world's most resilient city. Now, why did it do that? What happened in Medellin over 15 years? Well, it was, has been a fundamental transformative change of building dignity among the world, among the Medellin's poorest shantytown dwellers. And the innovation there was actually quite simple. It was doing two things. It was building a cable car to enable parts of the city that had never communicated with each other to be able to transport themselves without cost. And this cable car was actually a cable car which was built, you know, now five years back. And it looks like it's absolutely new because all the people are being so clever stewards of this system. So it looks as if it was built yesterday. And then they built a metro system, which is the same stewardship by the local communities. And then they did something very clever. They built libraries. Everywhere in the city now, there are public libraries built by top, top architects. So it looks like this most modern, you know, what you would find on Manhattan in New York, right in the shanty towns. And this has become the kind of dignifying magnets for these poor communities. And it's raised up the whole community in a way that has transformed the city. So it just shows that, you know, small, critical steps in co-creation when you collide in thinking can actually have big, big impacts. And I think that was very inspiring. So that's why the, the city focus is, is, of course, really critical. Now, where are we then um, heading with our beautiful little planet, tell us Earth, that we all know has become a place where we have rapidly moved from being a small world on a big planet to now being very clearly a big world on a small planet. And the drama is that we're starting to see for the first time evidence that already today things are happening that are, so to say, showing clear signs of risking our own well-being in the future. Recently, there was a paper coming out in Nature, this one showing that just the costs of abrupt potential risks of release of methane could cost the world economy 60 trillion US dollars. The world economy is 70 trillion dollars a year. We have increasing evidence that the Arab Spring, which of course we all have learned, was a tremendous, let's say, dramatic rising of a young, educated, connected, new generation of youth that simply rose against 30 years of dictatorship. But we know now much, much more clearly that what got it to scale was also a global food crisis related to climate change and rising phosphorus prices. Probably the first ever collision of social ecological disturbance that actually untoppled stability at nation scales um, ever for humanity on Earth. We know that 12 years of droughts in Australia is having repercussions on the global food systems. We know that when uh, Hurricane Sandy suddenly veers in and puts even the financial Wall Street three meters underwater, 
symbolically showing how the finance system is coupled to the earth system, which is often forgotten among traders on Wall Street, is very difficult to explain if we don't factor in the collapse of the Arctic vortex, which keeps cold, high air in the Arctic, which is pushed down in lower latitudes, interacting with the hurricane system, and doing something totally unexpected, namely a hurricane veering right in on land. They normally veer right out into the Atlantic. So that's the world of today at 0.85 degrees Celsius warming compared to pre-industrial. The reason why we are in this more turbulent state is that we have a quadruple squeeze on planet Earth, which we've described as being population pressure, a climate crisis, an ecosystem crisis, and the rising understanding that nature is not behaving as we have always assumed it should do when we've built up our economy, namely that nature is, you know, like walking into a Walmart store, resources are on the shelves predictably, available at all times, changing potentially in a linear and slow way. In fact, nature behaves exactly the reverse. Long periods of very resilient ability to cope with disturbance, but then while you lose resilience, you can abruptly knock the system over a threshold and you get an undesired state very rapidly. So this is changing the face of the world. And the first pressure, as we all know, the population issue, which is wrongly defined only in demographics. It is really a question of affluence. The largest driver of unsustainable patterns of life in the world is not the number of people, it is our lifestyles. And it's best expressed in this latest data from the OECD, which I find so dramatic. On the x-axis here, you have, this is the world of 2050. On the x-axis, you have number of people in the world. We are committed to 9 billion people. You know? So whatever we innovate, whatever we plan for in terms of city development, we simply have to recognize we will be a world of 9 billion people in 37 years. But the green box there is the predicted growth of the world economy. A 300% growth of the world economy over the next 37 years. And the red and yellow ones is what drives this, which is the positive story of developing countries stepping onto the development ladder. And we are, can you imagine it, facing a fantastic world with four, five, six billion people in the, in the world with an average purchasing power equivalent of an average European. This is the success story of growth, but it's also the biggest dramatic transition ever to occur. It's much faster than what has taken us into the environmental challenges we're today facing. It is now we go from the aperitif to the main course in terms of real pressures on the planet. So this is the, the big dramatic situation we're in. A positive with big risks if the world does the same mistakes as the minority that stepped onto the Industrial Revolution so far. The climate challenge we all know. We are actually following the red curve shown here, which is taking us with a high probability beyond two degrees warming. When we go beyond two degrees warming, we know with high certainty we'll get major disruptive surprise that will undermine a lot of our economic growth and poverty alleviation and well-being. We have an ecosystem squeeze which is also well documented. We know that over the past 50 years we've lost ecosystem services faster than ever before which are fundamental for our own well-being. And we're also learning that when we do like at this picture which Matthias Klum has taken from Borneo, when we wipe out 75% of the rainforest for palm oil monocultures, we not only undermine biodiversity and, and simply destroy livelihoods for local communities, we also affect regional rainfall patterns. We also affect suit dynamics, which feed back all the way to the polar regions. We actually affect the global economy because Singapore writes down its GDP with 2% last year because of suit from increased frequency of forest fires, which affect air pollution and the ability to live in cities. We even know that rainforests might tip over and become savannas very abruptly, which would be an enormous pulse of carbon and undermine a lot of the biodiversity and life supports we have. And then finally, tipping points, that we know that systems like this, which are not only beautiful, but they actually provide basic livelihoods for 250 million people in the world, can abruptly shift over to become a complete different undesired state with repercussions on sustainability and livelihoods, and that we must understand that these kind of abrupt shifts, this is from a paper that Tony Barnowski and colleagues published just a few years back, showing that by 2050 we might face the risk of a tipping point in terms of global genetic diversity because we might lose abruptly 
biodiversity in the world, which would lose out a lot of the innovation capacity because 70% of our new medicines actually originate from genetic diversity in nature. So this is the quadruple squeeze we're facing. That's why we are in a, in a new situation. It's so new, in fact, that science has baptized this as a whole new geological era. We have entered the Anthropocene, Anthros for us humans, which is in itself what I would argue perhaps the most important message science has for humanity. Now, what does this come from? Well, it comes from observations, and you've probably seen them, the hockey stick curves that you know, show very little change from 1750 up all the way until 1955. Up until that point, we had very little influence on the planet as a whole. These curves originate from everything from carbon dioxide to biodiversity loss, but you can pick essentially any parameter in nature that matters for our well-being. They have the same pattern. It's in 1955, we put in the high gear. We enter what science has now called the great acceleration of the human enterprise. And it's after that that we rise in this exponential increased pressure on planet Earth. So science tells us two things. One is that we do know from observation that we're starting to hit the ceiling of a stable planet. But secondly, what is so important is that this data is published over the past five to 10 years. The synthesis actually comes out in 2007. The idea and proposition of the Anthropocene comes in 2002. Do you know who, who decides what is on the walls of our schools when we learn what geological era we're in? Well, of course, it is the Royal Society, the world's oldest academy in the United Kingdom. The Geological Committee of the Royal Society are today discussing whether to rename our geological era from Holocene to the Anthropocene. So it's not as if we've known this for 50 years. No, we are, and this is important, we are the first generation to know that we can fiddle with the planetary system as a whole. And we are very likely the last generation to be able to truly do something about it. And that is an enormous responsibility, but it's also an enormous privilege. We know. We have the evidence. We don't have to hesitate that this is the situation we're in. Because the warnings came early. Rachel Carson in Silent Spring in 1962, early warning about the risks. The Limits to Growth report from Club of Rome, 1972, warning that the trajectories of the future could take us to a point where Earth actually would start sending invoices back to the economy by 2020. Now, these were shot down, as you all know, by conventional policymakers and business leaders. But look at the curve. You could perhaps excuse them. We didn't know where we were heading. We were kind of at a very early phase of that curve. Today, we're up here. So we have very little excuse. We have a mountain of evidence that now is the time for innovation. Now is the time for transitions into a completely new logic for world development. And that is, I think, a very reassuring platform to stand on. And that's why I would argue uh, we have engaged so you know, uh, much in the kind of innovation paths. The climate challenge, as we all know, is, is enormous. Uh, the fifth assessment that IPCC just came out is tremendously important. As you know, it confirms beyond any scientific doubt that the climate is changing, beyond any scientific doubt that humans are the dominant cause. But I really want to emphasize just one thing in this report, which is so important to recognize. You've probably seen these curves. This is the scenarios in the fifth assessment over the coming you know, century up until the year 2100. You see the red curve is what takes us up to four degrees. We are following this path today. We are on a four degree pathway. We haven't been at four degrees for the past 25 million years. Science tells us very clear that we can still follow the blue line. We can still envisage a transition towards a future below two degrees. So that's the good news. But what is so important to recognize is that according to the climate models, what takes us up to four degrees is emission of carbon dioxide. Actually, the four degree situation is a situation of over 1,000 ppm in concentration of carbon dioxide. The pre-industrial 280, we're today at 400. So the climate models still assume that these systems are intact that nature continues to be a resilient best friend of humanity. Because can you imagine that today, of our emissions of CO2 from fossil fuel use, which fuels our economy, roughly 55% are taken up by oceans and land. The world's largest 
free ecosystem service, and the best proof of all that resilience is at play. The climate models still assume that that will continue. So when urban regions expand, and when we continue to take on the challenge of feeding 9 billion people, we need to recognize that biodiversity and ecosystems play a fundamental role in the resilience of the Earth system because they, carbon, they sequester over half of the emission of greenhouse gases. And this is one reason why the innovation in the urban area is so incredibly critical because, as shown by Stefan Bartel and scientists here at the Resilience Center, just the urban expansion risks undermining 8-9% of productive agricultural land in the world, encroaching on ecosystems. So what are the risks then we're facing? Well, this is work that one type of innovative tool that was brought out by the Global Challenges Foundation recently, just to translate the IPCC in terms of risk. Because policymakers and business leaders and people managing our capitals understand risk. This is a 450 ppm future. We are at 450 ppm. What's the risk of reaching unacceptable temperature rise of, in this case, um, six degrees, which is really beyond anything that is acceptable? And can you imagine that when you just translate the current IPCC risks in terms of that future of a six degree situation, the number that falls out is a staggering 1.6%. So, to put it simple, we are today at 450 ppm. What is the risk that we actually could reach a six degree future already at the current state? And it falls out as 1.6%. What does 1.6% mean, really? Well, it would be the equivalent of accepting that 1,500 aircrafts crash every day. That's the kind of risk that no other sector in society ever would accept. And this is what we're accepting on climate risk. So how can we communicate these kind of scientific facts in a much more prominent way? Now, why is there a need to rethink development? Well, it is because if we're in the Anthropocene, we must ask ourselves the question, what is the state of the planet that we really want to sustain? And are we understanding the risks we're facing? What good news is that the business communities around the world are understanding increasingly that we are in the Anthropocene. You may have seen some of the, even the headlines in The Economist, welcoming humanity to the Anthropocene. There's a wonderful um, British citation in this Economist uh, issue, which I think also reflects very much the sentiment in science, because it says that with regards to welcoming humanity to the Anthropocene, that when reality is changing faster than theory stipulates it should, a certain degree of nervousness is a reasonable response. <laughs> and, and this is something we're not seeing in the political system, but clearly something that we might be wanting to think through in terms of how we communicate these things. And, and why is there then reason to, to rethink our entire development paradigm? Well, it's because if we've entered the Anthropocene, what is it we're leaving? What is the state of the planet we want to preserve to support the modern world as we know it? And we're starting to be able to answer this question in a very, very exact way. Now, you've seen these kind of data. This is 800,000 years of the planet churning in and out of ice ages. And what this graph shows, which is so important, is that temperatures at the interglacial warm periods, you know, the tops up here, which are the warm periods, actually stay very narrowly in an area of plus minus two degrees. And the Holocene, where we are right now, is right at the right, right end here. And what is so important is that last time we were in a warm period, 120,000 years back, even at that point, the warmest period was roughly two degrees warmer than today in the Eemian. And at that point, we had four to six meter sea level rise. So that is in itself a reminder of how narrow we need to stay with regards to how we manage nature. This is the last 100,000 years on Earth. This is from Greenland, showing temperature variability and how it was to live on Earth. And we know very well that this was a jumpy ride indeed for humanity. Enormous temperature variations. In fact, during the entire period of this tremendously jumpy ride, we were just a few million people on Earth. We were hunters and gatherers, and we had a rough time until we entered this fantastic Eden's Garden, which we baptized the Holocene. So the Holocene is what has enabled civilizations to develop. This is the period when we invented agriculture. This is the period when we developed cities. And if the Holocene is our desired state, then we can actually do what we've tried to do from the Resilience Center to define a safe operating space in green for human prosperity in a Holocene equilibrium, meaning to remain in a desired planetary state. And that is one way 
of defining a basis for a new development paradigm. And we're showing that for climate, biodiversity, and for nutrients, we're actually really outside of that safe space. This is a positive message for humanity because we can think of innovations to transition into that safe operating space. I'll jump this one because I already mentioned the sequestration into the biosphere. So what we are here to, to discuss and to innovate around is this recognition that we are having a new collision and interaction between the social and ecological space that we need to reconnect to the biosphere in terms of thinking of innovation and understanding the hyperconnectedness in the Anthropocene. You've seen these slides of how fundamentally interconnected the world is. What we're trying to explain from science is that we're not only interconnected, we're also interdependent, meaning that how we manage our rainforests, our lakes, our ocean systems feeds back right into prosperity in how we consume and live our lives. And I see that the time is, is really short here, so I, I was, I, I'll just stop the slides here, in fact, and just round up with some of the key positive sides of the opportunities in a transition of this kind. What we're showing in a much of the science that we're involved in with colleagues around the world is that understanding the predicament is a tool for innovation and positive transitions, that we have so much evidence in the past of human history that when we understand a challenge is the moment where we can rise and innovate. So a crisis or putting the cards on the table should be used as an opportunity, not as a way of grinding down in depression. And that we have examples from large systems with changes in management of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, all the way to innovations in agriculture in Latin America, throwing away the plow and, and moving right into new sustainable and resilient systems for food production. And there's, as has been emphasized already, enormous opportunities to transform urban systems where 60% of the cities have not even been built yet to cater for a rising population. So the, this is the moment in time to explore the major transitions. And what are those major transitions? Where clearly the world needs a transformation into a zero carbon energy system in the world by mid or second half of the century. We clearly need a world transition into sustainable food systems. And both these transitions have to occur in the context of a rapidly urbanizing world. And the key message to, to us in this room is that science shows that these transitions are possible. We can succeed. We have the knowledge. We simply need to start a momentous process of getting into gear to see these transformations as opportunities, not as tremendous burdens. There's no contradiction between sustainability and well-being. On the contrary, sustainability is the very precondition for well-being in the future. And if we could unlock that potential, then there is an enormous opportunity in the alliance between science and innovation from technology to behavior. And that, I think, is, is what we're trying to have as a basis for, for this discussion here. It will require tremendous rethinking of our entire economic logic all the way to what is really value and quality of life. The interesting thing is that it will boil down to reconnecting our lives and economies to the biosphere because the biosphere provides the basis for human well-being. The window is still open, but it's actually closing, and therefore it's so urgent to start thinking really creatively about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan.